Hello everyone, I'm Asha Nayaswamy and we're continuing our study of the essence of the Bhagavad Gita, Yogananda's interpretation, Swami Kriyananda's editing of that. So we are on uh, stanza 3, verse 35 of the Gita, which is the chapter in this book called Freedom Through Action, which is actually page 15, chapter 15 of this book. The Gita is 18 chapters, but the, the book chapters are different than the Gita. So we have a couple of uh, exceedingly well-known verses. I don't, we'll get through at least one of them. 335. Oops, I want to start with a prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to attune ourselves to your inward presence, that we may live in this world in constant remembrance of our responsibility to be your instrument, of the joy of being your instrument. Guide us that the aspirations of our hearts be fulfilled. We are your children. Bless us and protect us. Om. Peace. Amen. So, 335. To do one's own duty, even unsuccessfully, is better than to do someone else's duty successfully. It is better to die while trying to accomplish one's own duty than to settle for another's duty, though safer and easier. That course is filled with danger and uncertainty to follow another's dharma. The word dharma is, uh, he uses the word duty, which is, is an English, English translation for the word dharma, uh, but duty doesn't quite touch it in the same way as dharma. Um, dharma is that action which leads to higher consciousness. And so other people's, um, so the very, what makes a duty your duty is that the, um, the performance of it, or as this stanza says, even the sincere effort to perform it moves you in the direction of expanded awareness. So it doesn't really have to do necessarily with talent or affinity. It has to do with that which will help you to expand your consciousness. Now don't misunderstand. The mere fact that you have no talent or no affinity with something does not necessarily mean it's your duty, therefore, because it's impossible. Swami Kriyananda gave us a very good example of this. When he first came as a monk to Mount Washington, the ashram where Yogananda was living, Swami had been, uh, was, and is, and uh, well, is... His, he's out of his body now, but he was an intellectual man. He was musical. He was literary. Um, he actually p- played tennis. He was a very good tennis player. He was a very fast runner. He used to ski. Most of us who knew him uh, after the age of 36, which is when he was separated from um, Self-Realization Fellowship and went out on his own and started Ananda, by that point, simultaneously with starting Ananda, he developed um, arthritis. He began to develop arthritis in his hips. He actually literally was taking the karma of starting the community onto his own body. So as a consequence, we really never saw Swamiji when he was physically fit, you might say, or physically active. But he was a a good sportsman and a good dancer. He could do lots of things quite well with his body. Um, But he wasn't really, he, he wasn't a manual laborer and he wasn't a craftsman with his hands or anything like that. But he was 22 years old, he was a young man, he comes in to live at the monastery at Mount Washington, and they were building India Center at the Hollywood Church at that time, I think, one of Master's ashrams. And Swamiji was put to work as a carpenter, and he had no experience and basically no attunement at all with being a carpenter. As he put it, he said if there was a nail to hammer in, he would hit his thumb nine times, and then the tenth time might hit the nail, and very likely at that point it would bend. (laughs) So it just it just wasn't anything he could do very well. And in fact, actually, at the end of working on a job, he said to the foreman, who was a professional that had been hired, I sure learned a lot on this job. And the foreman said, really? 
<laughs> he had noticed no discernible improvement in Swami's skills, but he did it cheerfully enough. In fact, he did it quite cheerfully. He was a monk, he'd found his guru, he was in the ashram, he was, he was <clears throat> overjoyed <clears throat> about everything that was happening in his life. It was just a time of, of tremendous upliftment and excitement, and he was getting to know Master, he was getting to know Master's teachings, everything was marvelous. The fact that he was such a klutz at being a carpenter, and every day he had to get up and be a carpenter, it was just so minor in the whole picture. But after a time, and I think it was a matter of months, Master moved him over to writing letters, answering correspondence, um, administering and grading the tests of the students, answering the questions that students asked in the lessons. And Swamiji suddenly found himself doing something for which he had an affinity. So it wasn't that he couldn't do something that was against the grain, but when he was doing something that was with the grain, there was a certain natural flow in it. Now, of course, Swamiji had the tremendous advantage of being with his guru in the body. And so Master said, go be a carpenter. Master said, work on correspondence, answer the lessons. Master said, go teach in the churches, go give sermons on Sunday mornings. So Swami didn't have to, there was no part of him that had to intuit for himself what his dharma was, because it was right in front of him from his guru. Um, speaking, being a public speaker, was not something he wanted to do, but it was something that he accepted that he, ha he had to do. In fact, when he said to Master, I don't want to be a public speaker, Master said, it's what you have to do, you might as well learn to like it. <laughs> and in fact, then he said, living for God is martyrdom, and martyrdom of our inclinations, mar martyrdom of our whims and fancies, martyrdom of our ego. He didn't necessarily mean that, that it would be martyrdom like he would be shot to death for standing up and teaching people to do Kriya, although such things happen, you know, fanatics in religion abound and assassination is not unknown. But mainly it was what you think you want is not necessarily what is going to be the best for you. So all of us are faced, in, you know, in our lives with this question about what is my duty. And affinity is one way to tell. Um, there's a beautiful statement by the Scottish man who was a runner, whose, whose life was um, glorified in the movie Chariots of Fire. The name of the man escapes me at the moment, but you know, I'm sure many of you know who I'm talking about. The main point was that he was a devoted Christian, and he, was, he ran for Scotland, I believe, and he was exceedingly, he ran, ran for, the, um, for the UK, for the United Kingdom altogether, and, uh, but he was from Scotland, and uh, he was very, very good. But he was a devoted Christian, and he was absolutely dedicated to the Sabbath, which meant that he would never do any kind of work or anything on Sunday except give that day to the Lord. And so at the Olympic event where he was there competing, his primary event was on a Sunday, was on the Sabbath, and he just refused to run. And gradually it worked out that somebody else who had already won a gold medal graciously gave up his place to that man so that he could run and win a gold medal in a different event. Um, but his, he just simply, he wouldn't, he wouldn't break it, not even for the Olympics, never. But the, the part of it that was so sweet about him was, at least in the movie, this is how they put it. He said, the Lord, the Lord, I was made by the Lord and the Lord made me fast, he said. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. And that's just a beautiful way to put it, isn't it? It's like, I am fast, I am a runner, I was made by God, and He made me this way, and when I follow the way that I'm made, I feel that God is very pleased with me. So it wasn't even that I like to run. He didn't say it like that. He said, when I run, I feel that God likes it when I run. And so that's what we're looking for. And that's, that's a little bit subtle within us, because the likes and dislikes of our own heart are sometimes, they masquerade. I, I was very impressed by a, a very well-known spiritual teacher. His name is not important. But he's in a position, um, he, he said he never, one of the gurus in this line, 
is Babaji, the deathless master in the Himalayas and in Autobiography of a Yogi. A lot of times when people read Autobiography of a Yogi, they remember Yogananda somewhat, but they vividly remember Babaji, if it's someone who's just being introduced to all of it for the first time, because he's such a remarkable, mysterious character. Um, he, you know, he, even now he lives in a physical body in the Himalayas. Um, he can appear to devotees anywhere, anywhere in creation. He has a, a limitless span of material life in front of him. And he is the, do you, you call it the mastermind? He, in cooperation with Christ, is how Yogananda puts it in Autobiography of a Yogi, has planned the salvation of this age. So Babaji looms as this extraordinary character. But part of the uh, part of the story of Babaji is that he is not easily accessible. It's not like you can just get on a plane to India and go to India and go to his ashram and there he's sitting. There have been from time to time people who have claimed to be that Babaji who did sit in ashrams and invite you to come. But the bigger tradition of India which is by no means exclusive to Yogananda. It's this huge tradition all over India. The Badrinath Temple up in the Himalayas, for example, ancient temple is dedicated to Babaji. Um, so, now let me just think what I was saying about it. Oh, yes. Um, but because he's so subtle, um, the, the, the autobiography of a yogi does say, whoever says the name of Babaji with devotion attracts to himself a sincere blessing. But this modern spiritual teacher, who's very authentic, said, the capacity of the human imagination, he said, is limitless. And he said, for that reason, this teacher said, I rarely talk about Babaji, because he's concerned that if he talks about him too much, people's imaginations will become engaged, and they will think they are having true experiences when it, it is not necessarily valid. And I don't mean to make everybody paranoid who's ever had a superconscious dream or had a sense of inclination or believes deeply, as I do, that I have said the name of Babaji and I have attracted an instant blessing and I know it was not my imagination. So I'm not saying nothing about it, but even Patanjali, or I should say especially Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, when he's listing the obstacles to true spiritual growth, one of them is false visions. And if, it, if it's right there in the Yoga Sutras, that we can become confused. And we become confused because we have many inner voices. And what we want to hear is the, is the inner voice of superconsciousness, not just the familiar voice of what I want and what I'm used to. So having said all that, the question, how can I tell what my dharma, what my true duty is, well, the best way to tell is to have a guru who will guide you. But if the guru is not in the body, then you have to pray to the guru to guide you. And the necessity to be guided by your guru is not mitigated by the fact that the guru is not in the body. It just leaves a little more room for imagination. So we also have to have some objective criteria to be able to tell. And of course, the best way to tell true from false guidance is what Jesus said in the Bible when the question was, how do you tell a true prophet from a false prophet? And, the, and Jesus said quite simply, by the fruits, by their fruits, you shall know them. He said, a good tree brings good fruit, and a bad tree cannot make good fruit. So if we're guided, sincerely even, by a false idea, of what God wants from us, it will manifest itself. It will show itself. Now, of course, this whole subject of how to know what is true and false guidance is very subtle because sometimes obstacles are a sign that you have to try harder rather than a sign that your essential guidance is off. So this is a, there's no other way to say it. It's just a razor's edge that just has to be traversed. Traversed with humility is a really good idea and traversed with a constant continuous inquiry as to what does God want. When I was involved in a very complicated project at Ananda and I was operating, I was operating on, a, you know, with a great deal of personal initiative, but the entire project had been mandated and given to me by Swami Kriyananda and I was pursuing it because of his uh, 
his instruction to me. And it, it was involved with the public. It was political action, and it was very complicated. It was incorporating Ananda as a California city. I talk about it in my book about Light Bearer. I always like to hold up Light Bearer. This is my years with Swami, and that story is told in here in the year 1981. But I worked on that with 100% of my energy for a year and a half, and I was, I, we had met many obstacles, but I was still absolutely going forward with full force. And Swami basically pulled the plug on the project just from night to morning like that. And I found out under unusual circumstances, I, I found out when he told the whole world that we were stopping. He never told me personally because there were no telephones and there was no way to reach me. It wasn't malicious. It was actually humorous. But anyway, that's what happened. But, but afterwards, I said, Swamiji, why did you change your mind? He said, well, I was meditating. And I asked Master, you know, what we should do because we'd met a certain obstacle. I was asked, Master, what we should do if we should go forward. He said, I felt Master very powerfully saying, no, you've done enough. I said, sir, you were peripheral to this. I was in the center. Why didn't Master tell me? He said, did you ask? I said, no. I just presumed that if it was true yesterday, it was true today. Now, you don't always want to be pulling the plant up to see if it's growing. You don't always you want to, don't want to plant it and look at the roots. But there has to be an ongoing conversation that is always open to a complete change of plans. It's, it's very subtle, this becoming fixed. You know, I've been, I've been working with that in certain situations in my life at the moment where I just, this is what we decided I want to keep doing it, rather than actually saying, well, what is really the best thing here? What is really making myself neutral in my heart? So Swamiji gives us, well, he, he, he describes it in a certain way, that action, which is our true dharma, is that which leads us toward freedom. And that action, which is not our true dharma, leads us to more bondage. For example, somebody could be a very, very good actor, or maybe a very good singer. But if they allow themselves even to have the success that their talent would bring them, it will embroil them in ego, and will embroil them perhaps in wealth and the misuse of wealth. So even though they could be very good and even have great success karma in it, it will, it will lead them deeper into delusion rather than freeing them from it. But another person who has that same talent, the effort to become successful, to discipline themselves, to hone their craft, and to be a great singer and feel God's pleasure when you sing, could lead them to a greater and greater expanded sense of themselves. So you can't say you know, just because one will make you rich and famous, that it's a bad thing. Or you can't say just because it will make you rich and famous, it's a good thing. It's entirely a question of, of what karmic balance you yourself need to, need to achieve. And it's not impossible to feel that on our own, especially it's not at all impossible if we continually, with an open-minded, genuine receptivity, just say, Master, I want to serve. Lord, I want to serve. How can I serve you? See, the question we need to ask, oftentimes people pray. They pray with great energy. They pray with great sincerity and don't feel that God is answering. I was in a situation like that when I was very, as it happened, I was relatively early on the path. And I had a complicated personal decision to make. And I just kept, what do you want, God? What do you want me to do? And I just felt like I was praying all the time and I was not getting any answer. And finally, I, I went to Swami Kriyananda because he was the embodiment of, of Master to me. And I wanted to know, but he wasn't, he wasn't giving me an answer. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, let, me, let me get these stories straight exactly. Yes, it was exactly that situation. He's, he wasn't telling me what to do because he knew I had to make the decision myself. He wasn't going to take responsibility for the decision. It was important for me to make it. So I was saying to him, and I was, he, I was sitting um, on the floor, and I was sitting in front of this ottoman. He was in the chair in front of me. And I just broke down into tears, and I put my head down like this on the ottoman with my head resting on my arm. And I began to cry, and then I lifted up my tear-streaked face. I was very dramatic in those days. I said, sir, it's so hard to know what God wants. And Swami wasn't unkind, 
but he was unmoved by my hysterics. And he just said, I said, it's so hard to know what God wants. And he said very quietly, no, it's not. Just like that. And uh, then it just, it, it became obvious after that they didn't really have anything else to say to me. I did not feel I had been answered. But I was quite, I, and I was quite frustrated by what he said. And as I was walking back up the hill to the trailer where I lived at the time, I was sort of fuming a little bit. Well, of course, it's not hard for him to know what God wants. He's been on the path so much longer than me. He was a direct disciple of Master. You know, what does this have to do with my problem? And I got all the way to my home. And I went into my little meditation space there and sat in front of the altar. And I realized I had switched Swami's words in my mind. You see, this is how the desires of the heart creep in there and confuse you. I had said, it's so hard to know what God wants. Swami said, no, it's not. No, it is not hard to know what God wants. I heard him say, it's not hard for me, Kriyananda, to know. It may be hard for you, Asha, but it's not hard for me, Kriyananda. But that is not what he said. You see, just like a little switch like that, all of a sudden Swami's not taking care of me, he's not being nice, he doesn't really understand, he doesn't care about me. I say that because I've watched that play itself out. Just because... It was if you're not paying attention. But thank you, God. As soon as I sat down, my clear memory, which I, is reasonably reliable, said that's not what he said, Asha. He just said it's not hard to know what God wants. And then I said, I'm having this sort of dialogue with Swami and with all the gurus in front of me. Well, I think it's very hard. Swami says it's not hard, but I think it's hard. So then, but Swami had given me a philosophical principle that transcended both of us. So I, I said to, to Master, then why is it so hard for me to know? If it isn't hard, why is it hard for me to know? And the voice I heard, who, who knows who it was, I thought of it as Swami, felt like an internal dialogue I was having with him. He said, uh, because you don't want to know. Of course, at that point, I immediately again, just started protesting. Uh, but then I had to say, but I think I want to know. Why would I not want to know? Then again, very clear voice, because you're afraid. Oh, now I'm listening. What am I afraid of? You're afraid that you won't get what you want. It was just as simple as that. Oh, and then, then it, the situation was crystal clear to me. It wasn't hard for me to know what God wanted. I knew exactly what God wanted. I just didn't like it. So I, I protected myself from my actual true feeling. I just, because I just didn't want to admit, I didn't want to admit that I wasn't really surrendered to God. I know I wanted to think of myself as someone who do whatever God wanted, and that self-image really pleased me. So I needed, to, I needed to protect that. And then the other thing was, I was going to be heartbroken. And I didn't want to be heartbroken. What am I afraid of? I'm afraid of having my heart broken. Oh, well, there you are. But then my duty was clear to me. It was just not attractive. But it's better to fail trying to do what God really wants you to do than to succeed at something that isn't for you. And then, and ever since then, ever since then, whenever I feel confused about what God wants, you know, why isn't God answering me? Oh, what am I afraid of? There's always the question for me. What am I afraid of? Because if I can answer that question, usually the other question will answer itself. And because, and this is where I started in this whole conversation, a lot of times we ask God the wrong question. And God can't, and in that particular case, it was a real, it was a cut and dried decision. It was either or. But a lot of times we ask God the wrong question. And God doesn't answer us the way I like to think of it is because he doesn't have an opinion. Because we'll ask the question, you know, should I live in Detroit or should I live in Chicago? You know, should I study mathematics or should I go to beauty school and become a cosmetologist? You know, should I have a baby or should I stay with my career? You know, just, we just ask these questions, which feel to us like really big questions. But here's the unfortunate truth, which, again, we don't like all that much. I was present when Swami was counseling this woman. and Actually, I came in just after he finished but she had wanted to know uh, if this certain man that she was dating with whom she didn't get along at all had an absolutely horrible relationship. But she wanted to know if she was supposed to marry him. 
And Swami mm, finessed the question one way or another. But then after she left, he said to me, he said, the fact of the matter is she has so many karmic lessons to learn, she could learn them with any number of partners. In other words, her life was not so exact that there was only one possible path for her. This is embarrassing, I agree. You have to be very advanced before there's only one path for you. And if you're that advanced, you don't usually have to ask because it just opens up and you just know. But that principle, that I have lots of lessons to learn and I could learn them in any number of ways. And Swami put it very simply and Master put it very simply. It doesn't matter what happens to you in life. What matters is what you become through what happens to you. When I was in, again, another situation where I had a, a very either or choice to make, I said, Swami, you know, what should I do? And again, he wouldn't take responsibility. He said, you know, you, you need to make this decision. And I said, well, is it good or bad if I choose this? He said, it's just, it's just a thing. He said, whether it's good or bad is entirely depends on what you do with it. In other words, how you approach it and how you relate to it. Nothing in this world is inherently good or bad. Master said, everything is neutral. It's only good or bad depending on how we relate to it. It's only good or bad for us spiritually depending how we relate to it. And even that which is, quote, not a good idea, I mean, this is, it, it just makes it a little more difficult. What, what we want is to follow that path which will help us to resolve karma rather than creating more and that it will facilitate our communion with God. And if we make a choice that is more difficult, it doesn't mean that we can't commune with God and we can't work out karma. It just means that it might be a little more challenging. You know, if we make a mistake, it doesn't remain a mistake if we simply turn it to good effect. So the prayer that God will answer always is, how can I serve? How can I love you more? And even if you have a specific decision to make, if you couch that question, not should I live in Chicago or should I live in Detroit, the question is, how can I serve you? Where can I serve you best? How can I learn to love you more? What will help me learn to love you more? And oftentimes then, the clear answer you get is, it doesn't matter. You can love me completely wherever you are. And Swamiji, I remember once uh, another woman had she had an either-or choice to make that looked rather consequential to me. And she wrote and said, Sir, I keep praying to Master and I can't get an answer. Swami so said back, he said, because it doesn't matter. He says, take, take either road, it wasn't ma doesn't matter. You can love and serve God equally in either direction, whichever you go. God is pleased that you want to please Him. So what we're looking for, and then Swami says, that which gives us the most freedom, but then he says, freedom, for, Swami asked the question in the commentary, freedom from what? <laughs> Which is a very good question, because you can use the word freedom, but what is it that's confining us? In, in my younger life, uh, before I came to Ananda, before I found self-realization, which was before I, I met Swami when I was 22 and discovered self-realization a few years prior to that, I, I was driven for something, towards something, but I didn't know what. I thought of it in terms of escaping suffering and finding happiness. But as I, as I found the solution, as I began to find the solution, the, the, the problem actually came into clearer focus. And the problem was I felt so confined. And I didn't have any vocabulary for that until I had the vocabulary of self-realization. And I understood the difference between the jiva which is the soul, the English word we use, soul, the difference between the jiva, the soul, and the ego. And that the jiva is infinite. The soul is a part of God. And then it becomes identified with the ego. And in that identification, and this comes up uh, in another verse or two that we're going to get to, when it becomes identified with the ego, it loses connection with its infinite nature. And intuitively, you know, we know that we are not, we're not who we actually are. And what I realized is that I just felt completely confined by this ego identity when there was a, I would call it a karmic memory of a much more expanded sense of reality than the reality that was being offered to me by the world 
around me. And it was interesting because my first solution, even before I had the word limitation, my first solution was to become a mother and to give birth to many children. I never got to act on it. I, I want to say, fortunately, I never got to act on it. But in my own mind, I would expand. And I would expand by biological multiplication. <laughs> and then the, the thought that I was a mother with all these children would make me feel bigger and less confined than I felt when I was just myself. And then, I mean, that was a driving desire in me to have a baby and to be a mother, to have a family. But I lost it almost overnight because when I met Swamiji and I saw Ananda, it's just like, oh, this is what I'm really looking for. Because it was self-evident to me at that time, I could have as many babies as this body could produce, and I would still be trapped in my own consciousness. And it was the confinement of my limited consciousness. So when we're talking about freedom, it's freedom from the limiting identification of ego. So we need to follow that path, which will help us to transcend our limited egoic identification. And that's, that's why you could be really talented at something, but perhaps following that talent is going to make you very egotistical. It was very interesting. There were two different people at Ananda. Um, one of them, Swamiji, was strongly urging to take up a position, uh, in, in a, a teaching position within Ananda. Strangely, he was determined to make money in business. So Swami tried to explain to him, because he felt that it was somehow important for him to do that, and Swami tried to explain to him that spiritually, you don't need to become a business success. It's just not necessary for you to do that. The man didn't hear it and went off and eventually just went his own way in life. But Swami commented, and he was contrasting two people. This one, whom Swami had put into a position of giving classes and so on, and then pulled out of that position because he felt it was enhancing their ego. But he, he compared the two and he said, this one, the man who insisted on being a businessman, he said, overall, he has more ego than this one. But as a teacher, oddly, it doesn't bring out his ego. Being a businessman brings out his ego. Standing in front of, of people and speaking about spiritual things doesn't enhance his ego. This one, whom Swami said, is overall has far less egoic self-identification, is very vulnerable when they're standing up and giving classes. But still, it was that person's destiny, so over time they had to learn how to overcome ego in it. But freedom from ego involvement, which leads to a whole host of other delusions. So the way, the, the way that I've um, translated that into, into concepts that, that at least work for me and perhaps will work for you. Actually, these are not my words. I, I withdraw that. I did not create this. I'm, I'm taking this from elsewhere in Swami's teaching. It's really simple. It's called expansive versus contractive. And certain things that we do contract our identity, and certain things that we do expand our identity. My idea of, of, of being the mother of many children could have been an expansive idea. And I think in other incarnations for me it was. Just learning to care for others as much as I care for myself, the absolute self-sacrificing nature of motherhood, the necessity to keep harmony, to support other people, all of that could be enormously expansive. A friend of mine um, that I deeply respect, and he's very deep on the spiritual path, before he, he became part of Ananda, he, he was living with his partner in San Francisco, and he, he was, they were well-to-do, he had wonderful hobbies, he had a marvelous group of friends, you know, just sort of like, and he was refined and artistic and creative, you know, just lots of things he was doing well. But he and his partner, they said to each other, but, you know, but this isn't enough. So they adopted a child, and they raised this child who would not have had nearly as fine a life as they were able to give him, because he, he thought, this is a good life, but it's not, it's, I'm not expanding in this life. So he looked around to find something that would expand him. Now, for others, I, I recently got a, 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 something from a friend of mine who, who I hadn't seen in a number of years. I would say someone who passed through Ananda, because I haven't known them well, but when I saw them here 20 years ago, I thought, this, this person has a lot of potential, and their, their life wasn't with us, but a good person with a lot of potential. 
and, but I could see that they, they needed to push, push the boundaries of, of experience and accomplishment. So 20 years later, I get a very gratifying note with a list of all the wonderful things that they have experienced and accomplished. And it's like, for, for someone else, that would have just, there would have been no growth in it because I already know how to do this. And I can just repeat this again, and it won't mean anything. I heard a very interesting statement, but for that person to apply themselves, to have the confidence to overcome obstacles and be a great worldly success was very expansive. So you can't, you can't just look at it like it is. A friend of mine who's a music teacher, he teaches an instrumental instructor, he said, I believe twice, but it's certainly at least once. He had a, like a musical prodigy come to him as a child. And he said in one case, or perhaps in both, I don't know if it was more than one, the child stopped playing by the time they were 10, even though they were immensely talented because there was nothing in it for them. It was just something that they could just already do. And so to just keep following it, there was nothing expansive in it for them. I, I, I saw an interview with Yo-Yo Ma, who's a great cellist. And basically, as I remember it, by the time he was 20, he was at the top of his profession. And he actually talked about it was extremely, instead of being gratifying, it was extremely disconcerting to him. Before, you know, he, he was 20 years old, he was at the peak of his field. Where would he go from there? And then it was a it was a documentary I saw about, you know, these innovative musical things he was doing. He'd brought together all these world musicians and all these indigenous mus musicians. He found something else to do with music or something additional to do with music, because otherwise he could he could sit at the top of his profession and maybe year by year get better at playing, but it wasn't expansive for him. So this is, what, this is the question we have to ask. What will expand me? And what will expand me appropriately? You know, Swamiji could have learned to be a carpenter, but it wasn't an appropriate kind of expansion. This man, who unfortunately I think, he, well, he didn't make the wrong choice. He just made the choice he made. He insisted on, you know, becoming a success at business at which he failed um, because he was attached to that where he, you know, he thought that would be expansive because he wasn't good at it, is what I'm trying to say. You don't, merely to fail is not to expand. And this is where the line gets really tricky. What is really good for me? What will really make me better than I am and a better person? I, this reminds me that if it's at all possible to cultivate relationships, or at least one, with someone whose impersonal wisdom you respect. And I don't mean to put yourself under obedience to such a person, but just merely to have someone in your life with whom you can talk about serious issues and know that they won't just answer you from their own prejudice, but will answer you from a, a sensitive, selfless, uh, de at least a desire to help you become who you are trying to become. And even more deeply than that, who God wants you to become. And you know, these decisions are a fascinating blend of intuition and common sense. You know, intuition can be uh, beyond the rational mind, but common sense helps. As Swamiji said, too often false guidance tries to get you to develop talents that you don't really have. And you have to be really careful with that. Don't even have the potential. They're too far away from who you are. So I think I've touched that side of it enough, but th there you have it. That's what we're working with. Okay, so now, uh, Swami also puts it, he said, um, well, he just talks about doing what's right for you. Just really feeling that this is, this is the song God wants to sing through me. It's not always easy, but it's definitely worth searching for. And of course, that, the song that God wants to sing for you, I, through you, I need to say this also. It needs, it needs to be it needs to be original in the true sense of original, which it needs to emanate from your point of origin. It can be exactly what everyone else is doing. It can be to follow precisely the path that your mother and father want you to follow. You can take over your father's business and just do what he did and raise your family in the family home. You don't have to be different to be original. To be original is simply to do that which comes naturally to me, 
and really what I was born to do. That's an extremely important thing to, to think about because being rebellious or a desire to stand out and be different is one of those binding delusions that confuses us. Or you can take a complete turn from what anybody did. One of my favorite, I call this cuckoo egg stories, apparently a cuckoo bird doesn't like to be, be responsible for raising its young, so it lays its egg in some other bird's nest, and then another bird hatches the egg and then feeds, feeds the fledgling, and the cuckoo just gets to lay the egg and never has to take care of it. I believe that's true, as I was told. So every so often I've observed in life that somebody is essentially a, a cuckoo egg <laughs> laid into some family. <laughs> and the most extreme cuckoo egg I ever met is this wonderful man who was the artistic director for the, for the San Francisco Ballet at that time, or he was maybe the assistant artistic director, a very high position in ballet, wonderful dancer, wonderful man. He was a friend of a friend. He was never involved personally with Ananda, but he liked us, and through, through our mutual friend, he sometimes helped us with dance and occasionally would even dance. He was he, a wonderful man. He, he moved, I think he was promoted to the full artistic director. He moved to the Midwest somewhere. He was the 12th child in the family. He was born in eastern Texas to a cattle ranching family. All 11 of his siblings remained in East Texas and stayed in the cattle business. And he was a ballet dancer. <laughs> you, just, you don't even know exactly what to think about that. If there ever was a cuckoo egg, it was him. So sometimes you are a cuckoo egg. And sometimes you're just a chip off the old block. And it really doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. It's just a question of whether it's going to give me freedom. Is it going to exp give me an opportunity to serve and to love God more? Expand my heart, expand my self-identity. That's what our duty is in life. All right. So then number 336 goes right with 337. 336, yes. Arjuna said, O Krishna, by what is one impelled even against his will to do wrong as if he were being forced to do so? And Swami says, you know, so often, isn't that true? We just make a resolution, we're just not going to do it, and then, by golly, there you find yourself. I mean, just exactly as if impelled as if against one's will. You know, this is why sometimes guidance is a little tricky because we're not, we tend to think of ourselves as like one unified energy, like we're a single long distance runner and that's me. But if we're going to use the sports image, I think I am more like an entire football squad. You know, all the starters, all the worst players, all the people on the bench, the people on the injured list. You know, it's just all of it is I. And sometimes I've got the ball and nothing can stop me and I can just cross that goal. And sometimes I'm just huddled under the bench hoping that nobody's going to ask me even to suit up. And all of it is me. So I can make all kinds of decisions and then somebody else seems to take over, impelled as if against my will to say or do things in my particular life since so much of my life comes out of my mouth. It's almost always saying things. You know, just like, I, I know it's not the right thing to say. Well, I, I'm going to put this a lot in the past tense. But, you know, things would come out of my mouth. And even I would think, oh, you know, like, why did I say that? Impelled against my will. So then Krishna answers. I mean, this is a tremendously important question. That's why I said these three verses are huge verses. Krishna says in 337, Krishna replied, It is desire... It is anger, both of which are impelled by Rajoguna. Know these to be mankind's greatest enemies. Ooh, dear, desire and anger, here we are. For some reason that I really don't understand, except that I myself acted it out, a lot of times when you first get on the spiritual path, when I got, first got on the spiritual path, I was infatuated with the idea that I ought to overcome desire, which of course is a good idea. I mean, it's right here in the Gita, for heaven's sakes. But I also had the thought that this was an attractive idea to other people, <laughs> that everybody else was just wandering around wanting to overcome their desires. The fact of the matter is, it's one of the reasons why the whole movement of self-realization is very small. 
It's a very, very tiny movement. As someone who came to our temple once said to me, so they said it to me both admiringly and with a little bit of horror because I don't think I actually ever saw them again. They had come to one of our Sunday satsangs and just listened to everything that was said, including what I said. And she said to me, you know, I've been to a lot of churches in the area and a lot of people talking, talk about overcoming the ego. You know, I'm sort of listening. She says, but, but, but I think you all really mean it. <laughs> Which was actually the truth. A lot of people do talk about overcoming the ego, but they don't really mean it. I'm not casting aspersions. I would just say the combination of Kriya Yoga, the combination of really understanding the metaphysics of what ego identity is. People can talk about overcoming the ego in, you know, in, in helping other people or you know, being generous in certain ways, but to actually shift your identity from ego consciousness to infinity that's like, that's like a whole different project. And that's what she sensed that we were actually really talking about. A, a similar uh, concern was expressed to me by someone who, who came to me with the same attitude and said that she suspected we didn't actually support family values, which of course is a you know, code word in the uh, Christian fundamentalist movement. I said, well, for heaven's sakes, we certainly you know, support marriage and raising children in a in a harmonious and a uplifted way. But I said, but it is not the last word. That's right. It's not like as long as you stay married, you'll get into heaven. You know, we're here for freedom. And this is going back to the last one. You know, it may be someone's dharma to overcome their resistance and remain, you know, in that family. But Swamiji said merely to not get divorced, to stay with your marriage partner to the end of your life, is not necessarily a spiritual victory. Because you see, it might be contractive. It might be just an act either of cowardice or, or, or wanting security or afraid to rattle anybody's feathers. I mean, it could be a lot of things. And that you'll stay in a form that looks admirable, but for you, it's actually contractive to remain in that form. And for someone else, who has had many lifetimes of irresponsibility and does nothing but follow their own desires to, to remain loyal and stay in that position regardless of whether they're having a lot of fun or not could be extremely expansive. So you see, it just depends. So, you know, this idea that we have to overcome desires, this is when I, I tried to make my first convert and I was talking about desires and how desires just bind us and we have this, and Swami refers to this, you know, if you, if you satisfy a desire, there's a certain relief in satisfying that desire. But it's not necessarily freedom. It's just the relief of satisfying the desire. And so I was talking to her about the dissatisfaction of desires and so on. And her answer to me was absolutely classic delusion. Well, that's why it's so important to keep wanting new things. <laughs> because desires are unsatisfying. When one disappoints you, you've got to have another one in the pipeline. Or else you're going to have to live in the emptiness of it. Well, there you have it. And, you know, was a good person, but was not a devotee. So, then Krishna starts talking, or, or Swami starts explaining, you know, sort of what, what these two forces of desire and anger are really all about, and how Raja Guna plays into it. So Swami talks about how, you know, it begins when the soul, as Swami puts it, gets drawn out of itself. And these are metaphysical explanations that I can't really... I can't really flesh them out sufficiently. I, I mean, I, I don't have a perception to be able to do it. But the soul gets drawn out of itself and identifies with the body. And then and it identifies with the body and identifies with the ego. And the, the ego is, you know, defines itself by, by certain limited conditions. The body is the beginning of that. Because I have a body, I have a nationality, I have a gender, I have a... a uh, a culture, I have a language, I have a skin tone, I have eye color, I have chronological age, my chronological age shifts, I have hunger, I have thirst, you know, I have all these different things, all of which are, are constantly in motion. And, and they're also, they define me as separate. I can have someone with me that I love with my whole heart. But as long as we're identified with our two bodies, there's always a separateness there, isn't there? 
And we can have someone who we think is our dearest and our best friend. And then that one can have impulses that we don't even understand. Um, we can raise a child and have this belief in our mind that this is who the child is, but the child then goes off to school and becomes somebody completely else. A woman friend of mine, she uh, had an only son, and uh, he came home from college, and she read his diary, which she couldn't resist. She saw it. And so she read his diary and realized that the, the man had decided that he was gay. And in his diary, he talked about, how am I ever going to tell my mother? So here my poor friend is in this incredible position because she now knows what's going on with her son, but she can't tell him she read his diary. And anyway, it was very confusing, and she came to me, fortunately. You know, and it was like she never, it never crossed her mind. It never crossed her mind that this was who her son was going to be. Fortunately, she wasn't horrified. <laughs> she just, it was so unexpected. That's all. It just had never crossed her mind that this was going to come. And we actually, we play acted a little bit, and somehow she managed to get him to talk to her without her having to be, reveal too much. And it went really well. And the way it actually went well, just to finish the story, is uh, I said, I think what you should say to him is exactly what's true. I don't know anything about this. I think you're going to have to tell me. And that's just how she presented it. You know, you tell me what this is about. I'm, I'm way out of my depth here. And that just allowed him, you know, to be, to be the one who informed. And it was the truth. She was way out of her depth. She just didn't know what to do. But by remaining neutral, she was able to just, you know, play it through. And it's been decades now. They've all come through it, you know, in the best possible way. Um, but what happens is, as soon as we become one thing... And we become one thing because of the body. And this is what I was saying about even if you love someone very deeply, there's always going to be this separateness because we're, we each are individuals. You can't, on the level of ego identification, which begins with identifying with the body, you're always going to be separate. The unity, the experience of unity is right there for us to have, but we have to transcend that limited identity, move into the superconscious. And if you think of it as a, a, a pyramid inverted in this way with the, with the point downward, the ego is the most contracted our reality we have. And then we begin to expand outward and all the little ego points down here, all of them begin to expand and then the triangles all intersect, don't they? And the further ex they expand, the more they come together. So we, ha we are unified and we have this unity. But when we identify with the ego and the body, suddenly we're separate. And intuitively, instinctively, we know as separate beings we're incomplete. You know, and there's always something just a little uneasy. We're hungry, we're cold, we're lonely, we feel powerless, we're nervous, we need to be recognized. Make a long list of it. You know, everybody falls asleep and wakes up in the morning with all of these things just somewhere hovering in our consciousness. Then Rajoguna comes in, which is the activating force in creation. And so rather than just sitting there feeling separate and incomplete, this force of Rajoguna, which is this uh, energy that is part of creation, it moves us to do something about it. So I feel incomplete. Well, maybe if I you know, got a gold medal at the Olympics, I wouldn't feel so incomplete. Maybe if I got a girlfriend or a boyfriend, I wouldn't feel so incomplete. You know, maybe if I eat a bushel of apples, I won't feel so incomplete. But what we're always being activated because we feel incomplete and separate, and we imagine that if I could just have, and then you just fill in a long, 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 long. And that's why we reincarnate so many times, because that list is so long. And we try this one, it doesn't quite work. But it, for a long time, it doesn't occur to us that the entire premise is wrong. The, Raj, the Rajoguna keeps activating us to try the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. The Master says, what keeps reincarnation going is not that it doesn't, that not that everything collapses, but that it almost works. And that's, that's I mean, it's much more, di actually diabolical is the word I want to use. It's much more subtly binding that it almost works. I almost felt good about that. I almost felt complete. But then, 
as Swami explains here in the same where anger comes in, even as we're trying to have that desire fulfilled, the, the compelling force of, of the activating force of Rajaguna to solve the problem by external action, there's a part of us that's afraid it's not going to work. It's just inherent. Intuitively, we're afraid. We're afraid we're not going to get it. You know, she's actually going to marry someone else. This, my investment is going to go south. My house is going to burn down. You know, my ch child is going to turn out to be a lemon. He's not going to turn out to be what I want him to be, whatever it might be. I'm not going to be able to lose those extra 20 pounds. I'm going to get old. Inherent in the desire, the activating force that wants to make you fulfill the desire is the fear that it's not going to get fulfilled or that I'm going to get it and I'm going to lose it. And that annoys us. It just annoys us. I want it the way I want it. And hear it. You can hear it. How dare you betray me? Why can't I do this? Sometimes we direct the anger at ourselves. Sometimes we direct it at what we think is thwarting us. Sometimes we direct it at God. But the, 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 the activating force compelling us to find completeness through, through satisfying our desires is completely tied to the fear and the anger that will result when we don't get them. So this is what moves us. And, and part of us can stand back and say that, you know, this doesn't make any sense. But it's many, many lifetimes, many samskars of, of, of unsatisfied desires. And gradually, over time, and this is what reincarnation is about, we begin to remember. It begins to make an... A, 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 we, get to, we, we build a different samskar. And that samskar is, wait a minute, I don't think this is going to work. And then at a certain point, it occurs to us that the solution to this feeling of incompleteness is not to let Rajoguna drive us outward, but to tune into Satwaguna and lift our consciousness upward. And it just takes time. We have to have enough experience that we remember. And then it happens. And it's, it's a mystery how it happens. But everybody who's on the spiritual path is on the spiritual path because we recognize the, the unifying demographic of every person who, gets, who becomes part of Ananda, there's no other demographic, is that somewhere along the line it has occurred to everyone who comes into, into the door of the temple here or online or whatever it is, is that the, the, the solution to my inner unhappiness is within me and not outside of me. And of course, we can't immediately switch over, but at least some part of us is beginning to turn the searchlight inward. And when that begins, well, our salvation is at hand, virtually, because this, the, the mystic key to awakening has now been given to us, and we have accepted it. We have received it. As St. John said, we have received it. And ultimately, then, for sure, God will free us. So, my friends, God bless you.